So let's jump in to today's conversation about uh, about the blessings that we have and the happiness that seems so elusive, right? When you think about it, why is it that happiness is so elusive despite all of the blessings that we have? And research has shown, and this is something that is uh, that that has that has borne out not only in studies but also in in our own lives, and that is that the more gratitude we have, the happier we are, and conversely, the less gratitude we have. Uh, the less happy we are. So it doesn't matter necessarily what we have. It's about our attitude. Now, this is perhaps modern wisdom, but it's also ancient Jewish wisdom as well. In Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, what does it say in the beginning of the third chapter? It says, Eizehu Asher, who is rich? And the Mishnah answers, Hasamech Bechalko, one who is happy with his lot. Right? And, right, and uh, Tob, it sounds like you agree with me on this. Right, you think about it. It's like the mission should have asked, "Who is happy?" Should have flipped it around. Ezu Samea, who's happy, and she said, "The one who's rich, Ha'asher, the one who's rich." Right, that's how most of us would understand it. Like happiness, right, is the result, and what's the cause? The cause is wealth. If you have, if you have the resources, you'll be happy. And yet the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, switches it around, and it says not. Who is happy? The one who's rich. It says, who is rich? The one who's happy. And that makes no sense. That makes no sense. Eza who usher, who is rich? The one who's happy with his lot? What do you mean? Not ha happy with my lot? I'll, I'll, if I have what I need, I'll be happy. And so here, the Mishnah is teaching us one of the most important things that we can ever know about uh, happiness and really about wealth. And that is that happiness is not something that happens to us. It's something that we, in fact, um, radiate from within. It's a beautiful, beautiful hint to this. In the Hebrew letters. Um, in Hebrew, everything, every word is precise. So in Hebrew, the word for happiness is, what's the word for happiness? Sameach or, or simcha. And being in a state of happiness, the Hebrew word for that is, Bisimcha, right? It says, mitzvah gedola liot bisimcha tamid. It's a great mitzvah to be in a state of simcha and a state of joy. So the state of joy is called bisimcha, in a state of joy. If you switch around the letters, take the, the Hebrew word bisimcha, the letter bet, uh, sin, mem, ches, and hey, and you switch around the letters, do a little uh, uh, letter scramble, it forms the word machshava, which is thought. And here our sages teach us something powerful, and that is to be in a state of besimcha has not does has nothing to do with what you have, but it has everything to do with how you think. Machshava. How do you think? How do you think about what do you think about yourself? What do you think about the stuff that you have? And so again, the Mishnah teaches us: Ezehu Usher, who is rich, Hasamet Bachalk was someone who's happy with his or her lot. That is the key to, that is the key to Simcha, the key to happiness. So with that being said, you know, with this little introduction about the importance of gratitude. So let's jump into our Torah portion. Torah portion this week is Beha Alotcha. It's the last Torah portion of the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is always um, probably the most difficult book of the Torah. When I say difficult, it, it's, it talks about the things that are most foreign to our experience. Look, the book of Bereshis is about the beginning, right? It's about creation. It's about Adam and Eve. We got Noah and the flood. We have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. We have Joseph and the drama with the brothers. It's the classic stories. The book of Exodus is about Egypt, slavery, freedom, building the tabernacle. The book of Leviticus, however, is where things get a little bit technical. Talks about the, uh, the the sacrifices in the Mishka and the tabernacle. Talks about the different offerings that are brought, different animals, um, and, and other different rules and regulations. The next book of the Torah, which we'll start next week, is the book of Numbers. And it talks about the journey of the Jewish people throughout the desert and the drama that happens in the 40 years of wandering. The last book is where Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, recaps the entire 40 years uh, that they were together from the time that Moses uh, became their leader to the point that they're at the edge of the land of Israel. So the book of Leviticus, the middle book, 
is, I would say, the most glossed over, the least understood. And it ends with a very interesting Torah portion. And that's this one again, this week's Torah portion in Bechukotai. This is uh, this is a very interesting one. In the in the Torah portion of Bechukotai, what we what we have is it opens up with a promise. And the promise is in Bechukotai Telechu, Ves Mitzvotai Teshmoru, if you will go in my ways, and if you will follow my statutes, the mitzvot, then God says, I will give you everything. I'll give you the rain, I'll give you the blessings, etc. But if you don't, then the Torah proceeds to continue with 49 curses that are that are uh, that are promised for, for 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 turning away from God's covenant 49 um, uh, um, articulations of retribution etc for for turning away from God's uh, from 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 God's uh, vision of what of what life should look like okay so that's that takes up a big piece of the Torah portion and then after, so it opens up with blessings. It continues with the opposite of blessings. Then after that, it then gets into a very interesting conversation about pledges. When somebody pledges a gift to the uh, to the temple. And there's different forms of pledges. Hey, Sindri. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. So there's different forms of pledges that one could take to the uh, to the temple. Um, one could pledge money, one could pledge property, one could pledge items, other items. And the Torah gets into elaborate conversation about how you evaluate. If somebody says, I will give the value of, you know, of a person, of a of a field, like what, what are those values? So I, I, we're going to get a little bit into the technical details, and then we're going to get into some major life lessons. So the first thing I want to share with you and this is very important, is that there's two forms of, um, of dedications or donations to the temple. One is called, and I'll, I'll say the Hebrew terms, one is called hektish, and the other one, and the other one is called cherem. So again, uh, the two words are hektish and cherem. What is hektish? Hektish means, person says, I will uh, designate this, um, I will donate a piece of my land, you know, whatever size it is, I'll donate, you know, X square acres or whatever square feet of, of my land, and I'm going to give it as a gift to the temple. So that's one, that's one option. Now we're going to see how the, uh, how that process works with the donation and, and, and the receiving of the donation uh, from the temple. We'll get there in a second. Um, the second form of gift is called the cherem. And we'll see soon, I'm not going to translate it right now because that's going to be a major piece of the conversation. We're going to see soon the distinction between hektish and cherem. So let's begin. Let's begin inside. Let's see how these verses play, play out in the actual Torah reading. So what I want to do is I'm going to pull up this, uh, this text on the screen. You guys have it here in front of you. Give me one second here. Let's find this. Torah studies. Boom. Text number one. Torah portion Duchu Kotai. Okay. All right, Sindrine, please, if you don't mind, please get us kickstarted with text number one from Leviticus 27. If a person consecrates some of the field of their inherited uh, property to God, the valuation should be according to its sowing. An area that requires a homer of barley seed at 50 silver shekel. Perfect. Okay, so let me elaborate on what text number one means. Okay, so here we're talking about somebody who is donating some of their field to God, in other words, to the temple. The field that we're talking about here is not just any property, but it's specifically of the inherited property, which just quickly explain what that means. When the Jewish people ultimately went to the land of Israel, the land was divided into, into area of lands for, for all 12 tribes. So every tribe had its designated area, like a state, as it were, belonging to Ruvain, Shimon, etc. Within each tribe, every, every tribe had a number of families, and the families got a, a specific portion of land within that larger section for the tribe. Okay. So let's say you have a piece of land that is um, your 
ancestral, you know, Israel and uh, original apportioned piece of land that, that your family got when they went into Israel the first time. So great. And then a person says, okay, I'm going to donate some of this land to the temple. We call this again, hectish in the, in the uh, English is translated as consecrates. This is consecrated land. Hectish is like Kodesh holy. You're taking something that is otherwise fairly mundane, like a piece of land, and you are conse consecrating it, designating it to the temple use. And that is something uh, that, that kind of elevates the stature of the land to, to holy ownership. Here's the catch, not the catch. Here's the interesting piece of this. That is that even though you've donated it to the temple, there is an opportunity to buy it back. Okay? There's an opportunity to buy it back. Which means that it's very unlikely that the temple, the actual temple in, in, uh, you know, in Jerusalem, is going to have an actual use for, you know, Shmerel's piece of land somewhere, you know, in the land of Israel. It's like, cool. What do we imagine if it's like a smaller piece of land? Like what, what, what are they going to do with that piece of land? So either they would sell it and then just take the funds for the temple. The temple would sell it. Maybe the temple had a real estate office. I don't know, but maybe that would be a good, a good thing to have. Um, but otherwise, if a person donated, consecrated, right? Hectish, made hectish, elevated, uh, holy donationed a piece of land to the temple use, okay? And then the person said, you know what? I actually wouldn't mind still having use of that field that used to be mine. Can I redeem it back or purchase it back? The answer is yes. Just give the temple the money. But what what is the value? What, you put it up on Zillow? Like, how does this work? Do you list it? Like, how, how, does, how, how do you, how do you uh, determine the value? So I'm, again, I'm going to, uh, to reference the reference text one, please, if you will, look once again at what it said in text one. I'm going to break this down. It says the valuation shall be according to its sowing. In other words, according to how how big is the area of land that was donated vis-a-vis um, -vis how much seed can it hold? An area that requires a homer of barley seeds at 50 silver shekels. So... Uh, Maimonides, well, the Talmud gets into it. Maimonides also clarifies. So what is this area? And in short, um, the area is roughly, let me see if I have this right. It is roughly, hold on, hold on, hold on. I did the math before. Now I'm forgetting the math. The math was, okay, it's basically two and a half acres of Two and a half acres of land for a chomer of barley. Chomer of barley is an amount of barley seeds. Barley, you have to kind of space out. I don't know. I'm not a farmer, but apparently the barley seeds have to be spaced out at a certain distance. So if you're planting a chomer of barley, based on the, the math of, of Rambam and my quick um, uh, equations into you know, current uh, um, land sizes and, and and terms. So I figured that it's about two and a half acres of land. So if if, if the if the fellow, if the person donates about two and a half acres of land, that's enough for one homer barley to redeem it back, 50 silver shekels. You with me on this? If you donated five acres of land, it's a hundred shekels. If you donated... One acre of land, it's less than 50 shek silver shekels. So whatever the whatever the size of the land, there's a set price. Again, what's interesting here is the Torah is design is setting the price. This is it's price fixed. I don't know what I don't know if there's a term in real estate for that. Um, there's some sort of divine collusion going on. It's not like you know, oh, it's the prices are going up, prices are going down. It's a set price. Homer of barley, you know, that's two and a half acres approximately of land to, to plant a homer of barley, and that is 50 silver shekels to buy it back. There's also another part of the algorithm, and that is it's it's only sold anyway, or it's only consecrated until the Yovel, until the Jubilee year. After that, it reverts anyway back to the owner. So to redeem it back would be based on the number of years remaining to the Jubilee year, but I don't, I don't want to really get into that because that's just going to add another layer of, of, uh, of, of metrics so they make things confusing. So bottom line is, if you consecrate land, in other words, if you donate some of your land, original ancestral 
property to the temple. Great, mazel tov. Either they'll use it or they'll sell it and they'll use the money. If you want it back, you can redeem it back at, you know, for a fee. It's this the buy, buyback program. You with me on this? Mm -hmm. Say it again. And the oh, to buy it back? So. You sell it and then buy it back? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But it's not exactly. I mean, in this case, you, you donated it. It belongs to the temple. If you want it back, okay. So there's a mechanism, but it's going to cost you if you want it back. Now, let's take a look at the next piece. And Toba, read this in a moment, um, because what we're about to encounter is the second law. Remember I told you we have two terms, hektish and cherem? So that was hektish. Take a look at text number two, and that is going to be here. Please read. However, anything that a person declares harem to God from any of his or her property, whether a person, an animal, or part of their inherited field, shall not be sold, nor shall it be redeemed, for all harem is holy of holies to God. So look at that. If you didn't <laughs> donate it, Right again. Text one was if you consecrated, i.e., donated some of the field, then there's a the process of of potentially buying it back. But if the person declares it harem to God, which we're not translating yet, then whether it's a person, an animal, or part part of the inherited field, then that shall not be sold. It shall not be redeemed. All harem is holy of holies to God. So if it's harem, then there's no buyback program. I don't know what that means for an animal or for a person. I think it means you're still, no, you're not giving a person, but you, it's still the value. But the point is you can't, I guess you can't switch it with any other thing. Well, stick with the field because that's, that's the, that's the apples to apples. If you, if you harem, again, we're not translating that an inherited field. In this case, you cannot uh, redeem it. You cannot purchase it back. So the question, first question is what's going on. What does any of this mean? What's why, when it comes to hectish, consecration, donation, you can redeem it back. And why by cherem, can you not get it back? Number one. Number two, what does cherem mean? What does cherem mean? Boycott. Oh, oh. So many of us are familiar with a, not with a form of cherem that has a negative connotation. Cherem, okay, so here, here, here goes this. Maybe you've heard of this before. Somebody does something really bad. So the Jewish community has a mechanism called cherem. Cherem is typically understood to mean excommunication, where somebody is like banned from the community, cannot walk into the synagogue, cannot receive an aliyah to the Torah, cannot, uh, no one should be doing business with this person. Like this is an ex. if somebody really runs afoul of Jewish law in a very blatant way and is not listening to the local betin, to the local authorities, you know, the Jewish community, at that point, the community blacklists the person. I mean, could, I'm not saying should or whatever, but Back in the day, certainly this used to happen on rare occasions, but it did happen. Somebody was put into cher. It's the same word. But what does it mean over here? That seems bizarre. So let's look at some, let's look at some biblical clues to figure out what the term cher means. Okay, so now, so just, oh, Ray, yeah, jump in. Hold on. You got to unmute. You have to remember to unmute. Hit that button. Perfect. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. You didn't hit it. Still muted. No. I wish I had. There you go. Yeah, I got yeah. it. You got um, it. It's a term <laughs> like when a man won't give his wife a get and they put him in her room, right? That could be one example if a man refuses to give his wife a divorce, she wants a divorce, etc. It's a very sticky situation. Um, it's very not uh, uh, not appropriate to withhold something like that. And that would be one of the grounds um, historically for, for doing such a thing. It's really when somebody is doing something egregiously wrong that uh, that 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 needs some some squeezing. And so the thought is, look, you can't actually like. There's, there's no other form of punishment that can be applied other than the community banding together and saying, all right, this person is officially shunned. And that's it. Um, uh, okay. I just want to add one more thing. That yeah. the word harem comes from chayrem. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
So that might give a clue as to what the real meaning of Hiram is. Interesting. Okay. Hiram. I never heard that. Okay. Uh, Hiram, maybe relationship. I'm not sure. Let's take a look now at text number three. Text number three is from Devarim, book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah. And here we see where the Torah uses the term Hiram in a very different context. And this will help us gain a clue as to what it means. Text three, I'll read. So this is a reference to, or these are the commandments about when the Jewish people will enter the land of Israel. And previously in the land of Israel lived other people, other nations that served idols. And here the Torah is telling us to get rid of all idol worship paraphernalia. Here we go, 25. Burn the statues of their idols in fire. Do not covet the silver and gold upon them and take it for yourself lest you stumble because of it, for it is an abomination before your God. So again, just very clearly, in the first, just, just to repeat, the first verse, Torah says, you got to get rid of the idols, burn it, do not reclaim the silver or the gold. That's a big warning. In other words, don't repurpose. Say, oh, you know what? I'll use the gold and silver of the idol, and I'll refashion it to something else that I can use. No, it is to'avat Hashem elekechahu, it's an abomination. Let's continue the next verse 26. Do not bring abomination into your house, lest you become harem like it. Huh. Harem. Lest you become harem like it. You shall utterly revile it and abhor it, for it is harem. Once again, the Torah uses the word harem, and here we have twice in one verse. Don't bring it into your house, the idol, the idolatry stuff, because unless you become harem like it, Revile and abhor it, for it is cherem. So what is cherem? If you look in a typical translation of the Chumash, of the Torah, you will find words like um, uh, cherem would be um, uh, something to be destroyed, something to be reviled, something to be despised, right? Do not bring abomination to your house lest you become despised or destroyed like it. You shall utterly revile and abhor it, for it is cherem, it is destroyed, okay. abominable, off limits. That's another one. We put some, someone is put into cherem means that they are, they're being, they're being shunned. They're being banned. They're being, the, the message is no good. They're being boycotted. Boycotted, right? Boycotted, banned, no good. You know, and, and, and it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's painting something in a very ugly light. That's what the word cherem is. Cherem is something that is very not, not desired. Yeah. Now, this, so now the question is, so what does that have to do with, with, with our case? Remember in, in text number two, we talked about if somebody declares something cherem to God, what does that mean? Someone declares their property cherem to God then you can't redeem it. We were wondering, why can't you redeem it, number one? But what does it mean, cherem to God? So now we have a beautiful interpretation from the Radak. All right, Sendrine, please read text number four. The Radak has an interesting take on how cherem relates to our Torah portion vis-a-vis -vis the laws of donating something to the temple. Anything that a person declares to God, even though the item itself is not destroyed vis-a-vis -vis the owner, it is as if it's destroyed, for we can no longer benefit from it. Interesting. Thank you. Interesting. So he says, harem is it's like destroyed. So anything that a person declares, harem, which means destroyed to God. So it's not that it's destroyed to God. It's destroyed to the person, or it's completely, I don't know what the right word is. It's like eradicated, eliminated from this person's possession from their from from any possible future possession, it's totally. It's like you know you hear the expression, uh, you know, burn bridges. It's like the, the, that bridge is completely burned and destroyed. Cherem, <laughs> it's gone, it's finished, finito. That's how the Radak explains it. But that evokes another question: Who would ever donate something to the temple by saying such terrible terminology? Someone says, "Oh, it's you're you're done," like. You're nothing to me. And now it's for the temple. Like what who who would say that? That's a crazy. that's a so again, we have two different forms of donation. There's something called hectish, 
which is where you consecrate something. That's like an elevation. You're lifting it up to the domain of the temple. You can still redeem it back, but you're lifting it up. You're consecrating it. You're making it holy. And then you have this other phrase, cherem, where you're saying, it's out, it's done, I'm finished with it. Who would donate something to the temple, to God, by using that language? David, you want to jump in? Yes. Um, I was going to say, it. Uh, to me, it has a connotation of, of separation, uh, segregation, uh, almost like the definition of holy, you know, making something separate uh, from the rest of your possessions. And so um, it's kind of like walling off part of your possessions to make it holy. Interesting. Interesting. So I'll tell you this. I like I like that insight. There is almost the sense that that's kind of like the first one, hectic. The first category is where you're consecrating it, you're making it holy, and that holiness um, is marked by separation and distinction and, and designation. It's designated for a higher purpose, like uh, Hebrew national hot dogs and such, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, I'm kidding, right? It's, it, it answers to a higher authority now, and it's something it's something separate. But 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 Cherem, I mean, you're right in concept, but Cherem also has a little bit of an ugly connotation. It's like, like Cherem is... It's, it's destroyed, sorry? Like divestment, to divest yourself. Right, Very yeah, negative. yeah, it's right. Yeah. That would, right, that's, a, yeah, I like that. Divestment is a good one, right? Divestment is different than donation, right? Imagine someone says, I'm divesting myself of my property. Why would you say that? Why wouldn't you say I'm donating my property to the temple? Why would you use a, a, a language and, and I think divestment is probably the best word we're going to come up. With. I mean, maybe there's others. It's a great, it's a great phrase, but it doesn't even, it doesn't even fully express almost the disdain of harem. Harem is a very dismissive, ugly uh, term. Um, K, jump in. Hold on, can't hear you. It looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you for some reason. No. Can I can read. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. Um, no so I just wanted to ask, um, I believe it was in Judges where, was it Japheth who who said the first thing that came out of his yeah. house yeah. that he wanted to dedicate it? So what exactly happened then to his daughter and how, how yeah, what happened? Give that. He was, that was quite the story. Yeah, he was uh, um, was a mighty man, rejected by his family, rejected by his community. Came back as a hero, and uh, said, "Set prayed to God that if I'm victorious in battle, first thing that comes to greet me, I will offer as an offering." And out comes his after he's victorious, out comes his daughter. Um, yeah, that's we'll we'll have to leave that for another conversation. But I've I, I've taught class on that. Suffice to say, there's a, there's a dispute as to exactly what happened with her. Some say that he offered her as an offer. He took her life, which is crazy. Um, and it's a cautionary tale about uh, making promises. And I don't. There's a there's a lot of problems with that story, and certainly a lot of lessons to learn from. It. But it's it's gonna pull us a little bit off. But you're right. Not all offerings and donations are healthy. And holy. Um, so here we have this idea of harem, which has this ugly connotation and this divestment. It's like, I don't want anymore. The key to understanding it is really a beautiful um, interpretation from the Sefer HaChinuch. Okay, so Sefer HaChinuch is going to be text number five. Toba, I'll ask you to read this in a, in a moment, but let me first set this up. If you look at the bio on the side of text five, you see that it says Rabbi Aaron Halevi of Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So he was just a tremendous scholar, lived in the 1200s. So this is going back many hundreds of years. Um, almost 800 years ago was this book written, Sefer Achinuch, and it explains. I, I'm, I'm recommending this for your to, to, to read list. It basically runs through all 613 mitzvot of the Torah and gives a rational explanation. And, and some inspiration of every mitzvah. It's a great, you know, classic mitzvah book. 
All right, with that in mind, here's how he describes the um, the the mitzvah of this cherem mitzvah. Take it away, text number five. As long as the Jewish people are devoted to God's Torah and mitzvot, only good will come to them, and they will be supported by an abundance of blessing and a generous and pure spirit. The opposite, curses and destruction, will befall their enemies. Therefore, if someone in a fit of melancholy utters an expression of curse or harem about their money or their land, which are really blessed, the Torah informs us that one cannot really remove an item from the domain of blessings to another, cursed domain, for everything that belongs to a Jew really belongs to God who is blessed. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, because we know that this person really wants to remove this item from their possession, we'll give them what they wished for and return the item to its true master and then it will become truly holy. What he's saying here, and I'm hoping everyone is paying attention to this text, because this text is throwing us for a loop, and it's so important as to what's going on over here. In this text, uh, uh, um, Sefer HaChinuch, the book, reveals to us the truth about Kerem. Kerem is not a donation. Hectish is the do Someone says, I I'm, I'm going to donate my field, my property to the temple. That's hectish. You make a donation, right? That's hectish. Cherem is not a donation. You know what cherem is? Cherem is where a person says, oh, I don't like this thing. I don't like this field. I don't like this house. I don't like this, uh, this bicycle. I don't like this car. It's expressing negativity about one of your blessings. Cherem is when you speak about your blessings, in a dismissive way, in an ugly way, in an angry way, in a in a in a not grateful way, comes along the Torah. Listen to this. The Torah says, "Do you know what happens when you when you render one of your blessings as a curse? It's not a curse, objectively. God has given it to you. It's a blessing, but you don't see it as a blessing. You're kvetching about it. I know Jews like to kvetch, but here's the here is here's the truth about kvetching." This is the flip side of kvetching. If you kvetch about it, says the Torah, it means you don't want it. So God says, you don't want one of my blessings? I, I think it's a blessing. I gave it to you. You don't want it? No one's going to force you to have it. I'll take it back. That's what Rabbi Aaron Levy says. Turns out, and that's why you can't get it back. Once, once you've turned on it, once you've said, oh, I don't like that, God says, okay, you don't want it? I'll take it back, but you're not getting it back anymore. So if you donate something and as an act of goodwill, great. You can always get it back. You can redeem it back. Pay the money. You can get the thing back. You get the, the piece of land back. But if you say, I don't like this land, like, why did I get this land? You know, my neighbor has better land than I. I got this piece of land from the original division. It's ugly land. You know, it, it, it's, it's not the land that I like. Okay. All right. Loud and clear. We God says, got you. I'll be taking that back now. That's what Cherem is. Take a look at the next text. This is from Rabbi Shol Zev Gustman. Listen to this. Um, take a look at this text. This will also clarify. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll read part of it. In my humble opinion, the concept of Cherem is as follows. Look at this. In truth, one who declares a property Cherem does not intend to donate it to the priest nor the temple treasury. Rather, they simply declare a Cherem curse. All the pursuant laws of Cherem are there, are only there to fix the curse. Cherem, he says, is like a curse. You're saying, I don't like it. I hate it. It's the worst. Okay. All right. So, so good. Taking it back. Indeed, the Mishnah does not say the owner gives it to the Kohen. Rather, it says that the property is given to the Kohen, implying that this was not the owner's intention, but rather the Torah's way of handling the Cherem. It also does not say that the field is given to the Kohen like Truma, implying that it is given to the Kohen like the other rites of priesthood. Rather, giving it to a Kohen is simply the protocol for a harem field. The Sefer HaChinach writes explicitly, as we said, which we just read, right? that harem is a curse the owner pronounces on the property. Therefore, it becomes forbidden for the owner to derive any benefit from it. We obey the owner's wishes to make it a cursed field but we fixed the curse by giving it to a coin and we'll stop right there. So what's the point? The point of this is 
that cherem, it turns out, is not where the person intends on donating it. That's called hektish. If you have something and you want to give, you want to gift it to the Kohen or gift it to the temple, great, you can do that. Call that a donation. It's called hektish. You're elevating it. You're consecrating it, making it holy, separate it. Like David said, you're separating it from yourself. You're walling yourself off almost. Fine, great, but that's all, all in the positive. When it's, a, uh, when it's a positive experience, you can redeem it back, etc. But if a person says, I don't like it, it's cursed, right? The house is haunted. I'm kidding. Maybe that's not exactly what it is, but this, this is cursed. I don't want it anymore. Okay, so then it's no longer yours. God says, I'll take that back. You didn't give it. God, God takes it away. Now, how exactly would that work? I mean, what were there? Were there like, were there police monitoring all conversation inside a house? If somebody says something negative, they just come and repo it. It's like, oh, this TV doesn't work. Okay, I guess we'll take it to the temple then if you don't want it. I, I, that's clearly not what happened simply because they didn't have TVs then. But, uh, you know, as to what, what, under what circumstances, was it a formal declaration, informal declaration? All right, we'll have to look more into it. But here you get the general gist. There's something called hectish, and that's where you're donating it. Something called harem, in which you're cursing it. You don't like it. And so, again, the chinuch says, the important thing to remember is that it's like God is saying, "It's to me, it's a blessing. I thought it's a blessing for you. That's why I gave it to you. You don't like it. Okay, that means for you, it's for you don't consider it a blessing. Okay, I'll take it back. It's still a blessing. Now it's in my domain. Once again, it started with me. I gave it to you. You don't want it. It's like it's like if you don't it's if you don't accept delivery on a package, you can refuse delivery. What do they do? Return to sender. That's it. Cherem is return to sender. You guys with me on this? Makes sense. Rabbi, what do we see? Rabbi. Oh yeah, Richard, jump in. Can you not nullify a cherem the day before uh, Yom Kippur when you know your vows? Great question. Great question. There is a mention of cherem in the annulment of the vows, but I don't know if it's this type of formal cherem of this piece of property of, of this land. I mean, is there some sort of um, timeline within which I know when you book a flight in Delta, you have 24 hours to cancel it, change your mind, right? You know, is there, huh? Oh, most airlines, okay, yeah. Um, you get the 24 hour window. It's not all airlines. Not I think no. I think Nutson sent me an itinerary for Spirit. I do not I, think, yeah, Spirit's. Like, I know I got I got a thing. Spirit, if you want a seat, they charge you extra. They're like, oh, we thought you were just gonna. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. Um, the point the point is though um, that there may be other forms of harem that you can and all. I, I don't know. We would have to do a much deeper dive into this. These are just the basic laws. Um, the Maimonides speaks about these laws at length. The Talmud speaks about these laws at length. There's, you know, tr parts of tractates in the Talmud are dealing with this. But here, this is the short of it. But what what emerges from this from this discussion, which I think is is incredible and will lead us into a, a deep conversation about our own blessings and our own lives, is that here we have the Torah teaching us about the importance of gratitude and the power of not having gratitude, the negative power of not having gratitude, taking blessings for granted, but not only taking blessings for granted, um, looking at looking at your blessing and calling it a curse, the result of that, forget about temple times, conceptually is blessings get taken away. That is the message. Lack of gratitude, right? Ugh, you know, oh, this is no good. That's not good. <coughs> Think about the blessings ultimately leads to good things being taken away. Conversely, on a positive side, I don't want to harp on the negative side. Let's talk about the positive. Being grateful for the blessings, saying, Baruch Hashem, thank God for the blessings. And not only the clear blessings, but sometimes the blessings that you're not sure yet if it's a blessing or something else. But, but being positive about it actually brings more blessings. Positive attitude is key. And to illustrate this, let's take a look at another story. Um, story. David, David has a question. No, I think that's from before, right? All 
All right, perfect. Yeah, that was from before. So to and to, so to look to understand how this plays out, let's take a uh, take a look at another story. This is from the I think it's from the book of Kings, um, Chizkiyo Amelech, King Hezekiah, as told in this in the in the in the Talmud tract. It's an action. Okay, send dream. Please read text number seven. Give me a quick moment to pull this up. Text number seven. Yeah, take it away. The verse states, to he, to he who increase le marbe, God's authority, and for him there should be peace without end. Rabbi Tanhum say in Sephoris Bar Kapara expanded this verse as follows. Why is it that every letter man that appears in the middle of the world is an open man, but the man in Le Marbe is a closed man? Let me explain the question uh, uh, quickly. Basically, we know that in Hebrew, there's the standard mem, and then there's the final mem. Mm -hmm. The final, the standard mem looks like, I don't know, a mem. And then the non-standard mem looks like a square, basically, right? Like a square. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, you see right here, right? The little, the open mem and the closed mem. So typically the open mem is when it's, you know, when you write a mem, only if it's the last letter is, is it closed. However, in one verse in Isaiah, and I'm pulling it up, look at, look at the beginning of text seven, the first Hebrew word. You see that first Hebrew word? You will never find the word written like that. It's bizarre. Le, what? Le, sarbe? No, it's not a samach. Le, marbe. A final mem in the in the middle of a word. Who does that? So the Talmud asks, why why is it written like that? And by the way, in in in, the, in scripture, that's how it's written. Le, marbe means to increase. Right? He who increases. Why is it written with a closed mem? Continue, please. Here's what the Talmud answers. The close mem indicate that God wanted to make Ezekiel Messiah and he thought to make Sena, Gog and Magog. However, however, the divine attribute of justice said to God, Master of the universe, if David, King of Israel, who recited numerous songs and praise before you, you did not make the Messiah. Wait. You did not make the Messiah, and Ezekiel, for whom you perform all this miracle, and yet he did not sing any song of gratitude before you. Will you really make him the Messiah? Because of this, the mem is closed. Look at that. It says that God wanted Chizkiyahu Melech, King Hezekiah, to be Mashiach, to be the Messiah, and bring the final redemption. Because Hezekiah miraculously defeated Sancherif. Sancherif was the king of the Assyrians that were a thorn in Israel's, in Israel's side for many, many years. And Hezekiah defeated Sancherif. So God wanted that to be the end. However, the attribute of justice, Amidat Hadin said to God, one second, what happened after Hezekiah was victorious? He didn't, he didn't sing any praises to God. He didn't say thank you. If King David, who wrote a whole book called Psalms, the entire thing is about thanking God for everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you didn't make him the Messiah. You can make this guy the Messiah. There's no gratitude. Because of this, the mem is closed. To, right? Him who increases God's authority, for whatever reason in that verse, we would have to look again at the commentaries over there as to why specifically that verse. But the closed mem in Lamarbe indicates that despite all of the, all of the miracles and blessings, King Hezekiah did not thank God. And because of that, the potential to be the Mashiach was taken away. Here we have an, an, an example from the Talmud where blessings were allotted for, to someone, but because of lack of gratitude, they were pulled. Similar to what we said about Cherem. Cherem is a person says, I don't like this. It's no good. Lack of gratitude. Lack of gratitude, says God. All right. You won't get the blessing. All right. I'll take it away. It's not a punishment. It's just a natural consequence. If you're not appreciative of the blessing, God says, well, then, then you don't need it, I guess. Then, then it's not going to happen. Take a look. Take a look at something beautiful from the Talmud. The Talmud. Um, I'm sorry. This is from, 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 a, from Rashi's commentary on the Torah, not the Talmud. So um, to explain again, just to keep on this theme of the power of gratitude, um, take a look at text 8a and 8b. This is from Genesis, from the from the story of creation. And this is on day number, well, no, this is not day three. This is after vegetation was created. 
Torah says um, that it, it couldn't grow until day six, Adam and Eve. Why? Text 8a. Toba, please read. Now no tree of the field was yet on the earth, neither did any herb of the field yet grow, because God had not brought rain upon the earth, and there was no person to work the soil. Now if you read this verse simply, even after God created trees or the potential of trees and, and you know herbs in the field, but nothing grew. It was there, but it didn't grow. Why? Two reasons. Because God had not brought rain and because there was no person to work the soil. This is before Adam and Eve hit the scene. So potential, but potential was not being um, activated. Take a look at text 8b. Here we go. Now here, Rashi connects the two points. God had not brought rain, and there was no person to work the soil. Rashi says one is hinged upon the other. Take a look. Please read text 8b as well. Because God had not brought rain. Why did God not bring rain? Because there was no person to work the soil, and no one recognized the benefit of rain. But when the human came and understood that rain was essential to the world, he prayed for it, and it fell and the trees and the herbs sprouted. That is powerful. That is powerful. He says, why was there no rain? Because there was no person. There was no human being. The blessing does not come until there's someone to, uh, to express gratitude and appreciation and almost evoke the blessing. This becomes the theme of gratitude. You know, a person, human beings are motivated by gratitude. When you see someone that's appreciative of, of the gift, you want to give and you want to give more. When there's lack of appreciation, lack of gratitude, all right. So less inclined to give. The, and, and who is setting the model for this? God Almighty, God himself. God says there's no one to express gratitude. All right, there's not going to be rain until there's someone on the ground, literally on the ground. Adam and Eve, now we can now we can express, now we can share, now we can share the blessings because we will have gratitude. This is is the incredible lesson from the Torah, from, from, the, from the beginning of creation, about the power of gratitude and about the detriment of, of, of lack of gratitude. And it, and it evokes the same, the same principle as we said before. It's like this cosmic law of attraction. The more gratitude, the more positivity that we emanate, the more positivity rains down both literally and figuratively upon us. And when there's lack of gratitude, when we are closed, then the blessings are closed as well. That's the way it works, right? So if there's gratitude, if it's hectic, you'll get more blessings. Cherem, closed, closed blessings. And we just saw in this text, what is the nature of the blessing? The nature, oh, sorry, what's the nature of gratitude? Gratitude means two things. This is very important. Gratitude means two things. Number one, I recognize that this is a blessing, right? I could look at it and say neutral, or maybe it's a curse, God forbid, right? I don't like it. So the first step to gratitude is recognizing that this is a blessing. And part of that is not taking it for granted. Sometimes you can say, well, it's not a blessing. It's owed to me. Oh, that's the worst, right? The worst. I mean, it's not the worst, but that's also pretty bad. Like, oh, it's owed to me. So then wh why, should I, why should I have gratitude? It's owed to me. So step number one is nothing's owed. It's all a blessing and therefore gratitude. Step two of gratitude is, step two of gratitude is to appreciate the fact that this, number one, it's a blessing. Number two, the blessing is coming from God. That's the second piece of it. The second piece of it is to recognize that this blessing has an origin, that there's a source. It's not just a blessing that floated out of nowhere. It's a blessing that comes from God Almighty himself directed to me. So if we want to practice the attitude of gratitude for our blessings, number one, recognizing that it's a blessing. Number two, recognizing where the blessing comes from. And that magical combo is the gratitude that then evokes more and more blessings. It's literally like, like, like the, the vacuum or the, the draw that pulls more blessings. This is a blessing. It comes from God, brings more blessings and more blessings from God. I have to, I, I, I must read this. I must read this text number 10. It's a very um, forceful letter. I, I think it's very rare. It's a very forceful letter. Of written by the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 19, uh, 1956, it would be 1956, I believe. And 
it really it really hammers home this this uh this theme all right stay with me let me pull this up text number 10 it's a long letter by the grace of god fourth four shabbat 57 16 oh, brooklyn greeting and blessing okay, okay. The Rebbe writes, in response to your letter from the month of Kislev, in which you write about your current situation, how in your entire life you have never experienced anything good. And then you ask for a blessing for your wife and children. I, I just need to set this up. This person wrote to the Rebbe complaining about his life. And amongst the things that he said is, I've never experienced anything good. Like, no, I've, ne I've, I've, I've never had anything good. And in the same letter, the Rebbe says, you ask for a blessing for your wife and children. Okay, you, you see where the Rebbe is going with this, right? Apparently, you don't notice the contradiction in your own letter. For someone for whom the creator of the world arranged a match and blessed them with children, may they live many long years, to say that he never experienced anything good in, li in his life is ingratitude to a shocking degree. Again, you don't usually find this where the Rebbe chastises someone. The Rebbe usually is with love, right? Like a hallmark by love. The Rebbe is leaning into this person really hard, saying, you are blessed with a wife and children, and you're, and you're writing that you never experienced anything good? There are hundreds and thousands of people who pray every day to be blessed with children. Dare I say including the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself, who never had children, right? Mm -hmm. There are thousands of people who pray every day to be blessed with children, who would give away everything they own for a single son or daughter, and still have not merited to receive this blessing. May God answer their prayers soon. And you, who did receive this blessing, apparently without having to pray for it excessively, do not recognize the wealth and happiness they're in, and write in a letter what was mentioned above, and moreover, you conclude that you don't believe that God will ever help you, for you believe it is decreed upon you to be poor and miserable your entire life. Clearly, this guy was venting in his letter that nothing good was happening to him in his life. And the Rebbe is saying, do you hear yourself? Obviously, and, and, and this is a disclaimer, but it's, it's frightening what the Rebbe writes over here. Obviously, I don't mean that one has to be poor, unhealthy, etc. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that maybe the meager income and poor health stem from the fact that you don't recognize God's blessing in an area even more important than perfect health and a comfortable income, which is the blessing of having sons and daughters who follow in God's ways. When one, and this is the key line, when one doesn't recognize the blessings they already have, especially when they ignore them to such a degree that is expressed in, in the harsh expression used in your letter, why is it so shocking that they don't receive additional blessings from above? You see this? God has given you tremendous gifts, tremendous blessings. And you turn around and say, God hates me. Is it any, I'm paraphrasing, is it any surprise the Rebbe writes? And again, this is very unusual for the Rebbe to write like this. Is it any surprise that you're not getting more blessings? It's almost like if I were to say my own words, why would God go ahead and shower you with more blessings when you took the blessings he gave you and said, I hate my life. My life is terrible. What's, what's, where's the motivation to give more? Where's the motivation? Powerful. Powerful, powerful. Let's continue. I hope that these few lines will suffice. The Rebbe concludes to open your eyes to see the situation for what it is, which means that you are blessed. When you begin to serve God with true internal joy, God's blessings related to health, related to health and income will certainly increase, as can be understood from many sources, including Zohar, et cetera. The blessing signed by the Rebbe's secretary in the Rebbe's name. So this is a powerful letter. And along these lines, on a positive, on the positive side, right, to the other side of the coin, the, the power of gratitude is from another letter. Um, I don't see the date here on this letter, but here's another letter. Another point, which is no less important, is that which is explained in the Holy Torah, which is that the number of blessings one receives is dependent to a certain degree on how the person receives them. Acting in consonance with the recognition of God's kindness increases the flow of blessings 
and the capacity to receive them in both the near and long-term future. In other words, recognizing God's kindness brings more kindness. Appreciating blessings brings more blessings. Saying thank you brings more blessings. Again, there's two parts to it. Number one is recognizing the blessings that you have. And number two, recognizing that they come from God. And that evokes more blessings. We don't need to harp on the negative. Let's focus on the positive. More gratitude, more blessings. I feel like this is some sort of get rich quick book or some sort of uh, three steps to you know uh, health, wealth, and happiness. And the answer is, this is like the key. This, this key within Judaism is the attitude that you have. Appreciate the blessings. Say thank you. One of the, the core fundamental uh, phrase, phrases of Jews, when asked, how you doing? The first thing you say is, Baruch Hashem. Thank God. Yeah, is everything perfect? Maybe not. I mean, hopefully, yes. Could it be better? Sure. Could I use more blessings? Always. But if someone asks, how's it going? You say, The first thing you say is, Baruch Hashem, thank God. Why? You're not lying. What you're saying is, sure, there may be things that need improvement, but I can, I, I, I can, I can see multiple pictures at the same time. I can see what I don't have, but I can also see what I have and appreciate what I have and see it as a blessing, not take it for granted and recognize that it's coming from God. And that experience of being able to to appreciate what I have to say Baruch Hashem, acknowledge that it's coming from God, that itself brings more blessings. I told the story. It's in the text. We're not going to do it in some text 13. I told it a few weeks ago about the Baal Shem Tov. He went over to this guy that was studying Talmud all day. And he said, how's it going? And he wouldn't answer him. He was studying. And then oh, eventually the Baal Shem Tov said, why are you depriving God of, of his sustenance, of his nourishment? Say Baruch Hashem. It's the idea that appreciate the blessings. Not, don't just get stuck in, in the Torah. That is, that is the theme of tonight's class. Um, Express, we'll just do a few quick texts just to round it out. Text 13, I paraphrase, it's the story that, that I shared a few weeks ago about the Vashem Tov, about saying thank you. Um, oh, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's get text 12. I'm sorry. Go back to text 12. Take a look at this one. The Rebbe says, when a Jew is careful with their speech, when they do not allow any expression that is the opposite of blessing to exit their mouths, and they experience only good and an abundance of blessings. A blessing. Be careful about the convention. Be careful about the convention. Because the more we fetch, the more negative expression and energy that comes out, it actually is a blessing neutralizer, says the Rebbe. The more positivity we express, the more positivity comes down. The more negativity we express, etc. So be careful with our speech. Our speech is what puts it out into, into the world. Text 13 was a story that I that we, we spoke about a few weeks ago. Text 14, Book of Psalms. Give thanks to God because he is good, for his kindness is everlasting. There's 26 Hodul Hashems in Psalms. We say it every Shabbat morning. But look at that line. Give thanks to God because he is good, for his kindness is everlasting. You know what that means? God gives us kindness. He gives us blessings. Because God is good, and thus give thanks to God. Say Baruch Hashem. Gratitude. Don't ju not just gratitude in your heart, but verbal gratitude. Where is the opportunity for verbal gratitude? Baruch Hashem. Thank God. Someone says, "How how you doing?" Thank God. Thank God, doing well. Or thank just thank God. Maybe maybe things could be better. Baruch Hashem. Thank God. I appreciate the blessings. Every morning, Moda'ani. Right. The first thing we say should be thanking God for being alive, for waking up alive this morning. That's the first thing we say. Again, gratitude, not just in heart, but also in, in, uh, in action, in speech. What's the expression? Don't just be a cardiac Jew. Don't just, be, don't, don't just believe in your heart. Be, be, practice mm -hmm. gratitude in, in, in speech and in action. Show, demonstrate your gratitude. Share your blessings, et cetera. Demonstrate that you recognize that this is a blessing from God Almighty, who has infinite blessings. And the more you give thanks, the more you share your blessings, the more you're going to get. There's, it's not a zero-sum game. There's plenty to share, plenty to give, and God, and God will give. Are there things 
that can be better? Yes. Do Jews love to kvetch? Absolutely. The message tonight is just because it's part of our story and history doesn't make it the healthiest thing we can do. The book of Numbers, I mentioned a little, I did a little overview of the five books earlier. The book of Numbers, the 40 years of, 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 of journeying in the desert, lots of kvetching. There's no water. The mana tastes too bland. Where's the beef? We to quote to Wendy's, back. huh? We want, we to, want to go back. back. We in, in Egypt we had cucumbers and leeks and watermelon. It's so it's so dusty over here. All we have is sand, which is said no one ever right. These are the it's, yeah that was a bad one. So right, th this is the kvetching of the Jewish people, and our, the message tonight is, let's not do that. Let's look at what we have, see it as the blessing that it is recognize that it comes from God Almighty, and give thanks. And the more we give thanks, then and His kindness will be everlasting. More and more kindness will come to us. And of course, it goes without saying that it's not only to God that we should have gratitude, but also to each other. If someone helps us, we should say thank you. And we should have gratitude to the people around us. Why? Because that's what it means to be a mensch. And the Torah wants us to, number one, be a mensch. Number two, recognize our blessings. No practical order. They're all, they're, it's not, I'm not giving a sequence here. Recognize the blessing. Recognize where it comes from. Recognize that the blessing, God's blessing, oftentimes comes to us through other human beings and acknowledge them as well. One, one final text, text number 15, just to round out tonight's uh, discussion. Beautiful quote from the Talmud. Even though, look at this, even though the wine belongs to its owner, Gratitude is given to the one who pours it. Thank your waiter. Right? I, it's not their food, it's not their restaurant. They brought it to you. They brought it to you. Be a mensch. Be a mensch. The more gratitude we have, the more gratitude we express, the healthier we are, and the more blessings God gives us. So, in the final analysis, we started today by talking about why is it that despite all the blessings we have, all the wonderful opportunities, all of the all of the, the, the our, I'm going to use a Hebrew word, harchavu, abundance. We have abundance in 2024. Baruch Hashem, thank God. Oh, I just did it, right? Gratitude. Thank God we have such abundance in 20. Why is it that we're not happier? There's no magic answer. Maybe there's not one answer, but part of the answer might be, maybe we're not looking at all the things that we have as blessings. Do we think about air conditioning? Do we meditate on the <laughs> fact that we are in climate-controlled environments? I'm sitting in a room right now that's nice and cool. And it's it, it was hot outside, I think, today. I do want to go back to Europe. Oh, no air conditioner? Yeah. So, like, I, I was just one example because I'm feeling nice and cool here. And I'm thinking it's so easy to take it for granted. Mm -hmm. I mean, air conditioning, of course. What do you mean? I have AC. I'm paying for it. Why shouldn't I have it? The only emotion we might feel about air conditioning is upset if it doesn't work. But where's the joy when it does? Where's the gratitude? It's not only about the AC. It's about everything. We have clothing. We have shelter. We have food. We have families. We have you know the blessings that we have, whatever blessings we have. Number one, see it for what it is, a blessing. Number two, thank God. Let's not be like that guy in the Torah that goes around hereming everything. Ah, oh, this field. <laughs> I hate this field. When we when we when we harem things, when we discard, when we discount, when we disgrace the blessings, that doesn't help. That doesn't help God. That's not it's not encouraging more. Let's be grateful and may the blessings flow. Thank you very much for joining me tonight for Torah studies. Hope you enjoy tonight's class. Um and I think we should say the famous words at the end of studying a book of Torah. Repeat after me. Chazak. Chazak. Benis Chazek. And uh, that means uh, be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. And that also evokes the idea of our relationship. When we are strong, we also pray that God continue to strengthen us. When we're When we feel blessed, we pray that God continue to bless us. And indeed, may the blessings flow. All right, that's it for tonight. Any questions, comments? I was not supposed to say like so many blessing a day. Or yes, yes, yeah. yes. We spoke about that on a Sunday recently at the Kabbalah class. 
that there are a hundred blessings. We're supposed to recite a hundred blessings. Famous story that King David, one of the battles, lost a lot of soldiers. And he prayed to God as to what the problem is and came out that they that that we're supposed to be saying 100 blessings every day. So look, between the tefillot, between the prayers, three times a day, you get a lot of them. You eat some meals, you say a blessing before the food. But that itself is like, I think we spoke about it then. It's probably not that long ago about um, it should be an app where you can kind of like keep track. Because the more, no, I, I don't mean that in a, in a, in a slow way, but I mean the, the more we, the more we're cognizant of the blessings. You look at the morning blessings in, in the tefillah, like the, 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 the ones right at the beginning of the siddur. Thank you, Hashem, for giving wisdom to the rooster to crow. It means thank you for creating light and for create. Thank you for allowing me to stand upright. Thank you for opening my eyes. We take it for we take all these things for granted, and then only focus when something goes wrong. It's like the the blessings, of course, but the negatives, big deal. As opposed to saying this is a wonder. The fact that I can see is a gift. Helen Keller, she wrote one of her famous pieces. She wrote that she was speaking to somebody who had just taken a walk in a forest or in somewhere. She said, so what did you see? Because she couldn't see. She said, what did you see? She said, nah, nothing. She said, I was reminded that the seeing sees so little. That's her quote. And I was reminded once again that the seeing sees so little. Take it for granted. Don't even appreciate the fact that we see a beautiful world. It's like, but you read the blessings and you stop. You can you can cry when you say the morning blessings. You every single capacity that I have, I don't take for granted. I realize it's a gift to me for a limited time. I mean, we don't know how long we have, but as long as we have it, it's a tremendous blessing. It evokes wonder. It evokes a sense of of joy. And I think to live with joy is, I mean, what could be a greater blessing than that? That letter from the Rebbe, I know I said it already a few times. I can't recall a letter that harsh. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. But when the, I think when the guy wrote, and who am I to say what triggered you know, the Rebbe? But like the guy wrote, I haven't had any blessings in my life. And oh, by the way, could you put in a good word, my wife and kids? And uh and the Rebbe says, you know, do you ever think about the people that can't have kids, struggle that pray, and you don't seem to, to appreciate that you have this most incredible blessing without any effort, as it were, or without any extraordinary, you know, intervention. You could write a whole letter of gratitude to God for the gift, for that one gift. But instead, only focus on what you don't have. And then frame that as my whole life is terrible and God must hate me and I've never been blessed. And what is why, why does God have it in for me? I mean, there was like exasperation in that letter. Where I was like, what is happening? Like, what? How, how could you do that? How could you say that? So trying to really sometimes, you know, to wake up somebody, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta shake it, you gotta jolt them. I think that letter was a jolt. I don't know. I don't know who wrote it. I don't know how they received the, the, the answer. But it certainly has been published for us all, and it's, I think it's a wake-up call. I'm, 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 inter I'm, I'm internalizing this myself. Tomorrow morning, when I wake up and I recite the morning blessings as I as I do every day, but I typically do it very quickly because you know we got to get get moving with the day, and it's my pledge, my commitment, my resolution based on tonight's classes to pause and think about is like. I don't know, like a dozen or so blessings in the morning, not the Amida blessings, the ones all the way at the beginning of the Siddur, to think about each and every step. You know, I can walk, I can talk, I can stand, I can see. Don't take it for granted. Right? Yeah, sure. Appreciate yeah, it. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bathroom blessing. Mm -hmm. I was there. My body is functioning health. It's it's so it's such a quirk of the human condition. We take things for granted until we don't have them, and then and then it's 
wouldn't life be so much more pleasant if we would feel the blessings as blessings, be in wonder of the blessings, gratitude and walk around with a smile. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. <laughs> Can't hurt. It's got to be better than the alternative. <laughs> it's got to be better than the alternative, right? Alternative doesn't make us happier. Moral of the story, hektish not cherem. Our blessings are holy. Don't don't throw them out. Don't yeah. don't discard them. <laughs> yeah. We fix the curse by giving it to a coin. I don't. I I honestly don't know what he means over there. I know I stopped there in the text because I I didn't know what it, I, I remember. I said we're going to stop here in the text. It's yeah. because I don't. It's also a translation, so I'm not sure. I don't know what the original is. There, is the original in Hebrew? It is. All right. I I don't know. I I wasn't able to make. The problem is that's excerpted. I didn't look in the original source, so excerpted. Uh, I don't. I don't know the full context, so I can't. I couldn't make heads or tails of that. But I think the first part, aside from the last two lines, is very clear. The first part is this guy didn't even intend on giving it to the to the temple. He was just saying, "I hate this. I hate this field. Get 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 it out of here." All right, no problem. We we can do that. Let's not be that guy. Let's not be that guy. A blessing is a blessing. Um, I always tell this story. I love this story. There was a comedian, I'm not going to mention his name, comedian who once said on a late night TV show, he was sitting on a plane, sitting on a flight, ready for takeoff. And they announced that they're piloting, all puns intended, uh, Wi Fi technology on the, on the aircraft. And, uh, you know, everyone is free Wi Fi for everybody. Oh, amazing. All right. Few minutes into the flight, maybe 15 minutes into the flight. All right, it's not, it's getting a little glitchy. We're going to shut it down, shutting down the Wi Fi. The guy next to him says, Unbelievable, like oh, ridiculous. And he's thinking to himself, The community says, You didn't know this was possible 20 minutes ago, and now you're upset that it's been taken away. It's like <laughs> how quickly we go from not even knowing the possibility of something to then enjoying it, taking it for granted to the point that, that it's now an expectation that if it goes away, now we are, we're upset, as opposed to reflecting on the 15 minutes of Wi-Fi and being like, that was amazing. What a blessing. I, I wasn't expecting that. Now it's like, oh, I hate this airline. Unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, just the quirk of the human condition. But we know we know it's, it's listen, it's a bug. God created it. It's a, it's a bug. It's not... You know, don't feel guilty about it. It's normal. The Torah <laughs> reminds us to, to be aware of it and to, to push against it. Just because it's normal doesn't mean it's healthy. Let's uh let's be positive. All right. It's like let's... yo it's like Yona and the it's yes. like Yona and the and the coyote and the Yon pie. He needed God That's to remind you. That's a great story. God says go to Ninveh and tell the people to repent, or else they're gonna be destroyed. And he doesn't want to go. Many reasons why, but to cut the chase, he goes eventually after the whole whale thing, and uh, and they repent and they're spared. And God, and then he's upset. Oh, yeah. so God makes him a kika. He's outside and he wants to die. So God, he's depressed. You know, his, the title of his autobiography, the depressed prophet. Anyway, mm -hmm. so like, so the God sends a kika tree. I don't know what that is, but it's a tree to provide shade and some and some food or whatever it is. And then he's so happy about the tree. He's got a tree. And then the tree withers and dies. And he's upset about the tree. And God says, look, 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 look. You're upset about the tree. You lost the tree. Appreciate the blessings. And you think that I would be happy if so many people would, 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 would have their downfall? Yeah, I, I, want, uh, I, want, I want blessings and positivity. More of the story is be happy. I'm not going to say don't worry, be happy. We can worry. But don't fetch, be happy. That's what I would say. Don't fetch, be happy. I like that. Coming soon to bumper sticker near you. All right. That's a good one. <laughs> All right, Lelato, everybody. Good to see you guys. Tomorrow night we have the Decisions of Fate. And stay tuned for more exciting announcements of upcoming Torah Center events and classes. All right. See you guys. Take Lelato. care. Lelato.